Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, for those of you in the room, thanks for coming to Cleveland. For those of you who are uh, watching us via the website, thanks for tuning in uh, this afternoon. My name is Mike Caputo. I chair the Government Affairs Practice Group here at McDonald Hopkins. Uh, joining me today is Michelle Cantor to my left, uh, who is a member of our government contracting team. On our far right is Bruce Reinhardt, who is co-chair of our white collar and government compliance practice uh, out of uh, South Florida. Michelle's out of Chicago. And we're very pleased to welcome as a guest, Cynthia Johnson, who's also out of Chicago. Cynthia is the director of the Established Business Services and director of the Illinois Small Business Development Center at the Women's Business Development Center based in Chicago. Thanks for joining us today. It's a mouthful. <laughs> yes, it is. We are here to, today to talk about federal contracting and some of the newest uh, developments that are starting to make their way throughout the contracting world. Uh, we've hosted several roundtables and, and panel discussions on this topic in the past. And for those of you who've participated in those, welcome back. For those of you new, welcome. Uh, for the, what we try to do as part of this uh, discussion is encourage as much participation from the audience as possible. Uh, this is really uh, an opportunity for you to ask any questions you'd like to ask. They can either be anonymous or you can identify who you are and which company you're with. Uh, if you are here in Cleveland, uh, you should have a card or two in front of you. You feel free to write down the question you'd like us to address on the card. And one of the, one of the professionals from McDonald Hopkins will be by to pick it up, just raise it up, and they'll swing by to get it. If you're on the website and you have a question, there is actually a, a, a tab on your, on your screen. I think it says uh, ask a question or submit question. Just go ahead and click on that. You'll be uh, taken to a site to put your question in, and you can submit it that way. So uh, although we have plenty of things that we are going to try to touch on, feel free to ask any questions that you'd like, you'd like us to address, uh, and we will do our best to, uh, to, to address those. We're going to try to stop uh, promptly at 1 o'clock. Everyone is busy. Uh, we appreciate you taking some time today. If we don't have an opportunity to answer any questions that you may have and we end up having to, excuse me, having to stop before then, feel free to stick around, uh, and we'll try to address your question in a one-on-one -on -one basis afterward. Conversely, for those on the website, if we don't have an opportunity to get to your question, we'll follow up with you uh, directly after, the, um, after the, the session is over. <clears throat> As I said, we're here to talk about federal contracting and some of the uh, recent developments that, uh, that the, the, the uh, panelists are seeing in their respective uh, industries and spaces. But before we, we get into some of those specific items, uh, we thought it might make sense to talk a little bit about why this is becoming such a big deal. Why do people and businesses care so much about selling their services, selling their products to government? What's the benefit to them? And so uh, what, what we thought we might do, and Michelle, I'll, I'll ask you to, to jump right in here, talk a little bit about what you're seeing as far as the, the opportunities to do business with government and why so many folks are starting to, to really look at how they can partner with government from a business uh, standpoint. Well, first of all, thank you. First of all, the reason I see that many people have moved their businesses to the federal government was a big dry up in the private sector. And uh, people started thinking, well, wow, I've been selling my services and my products and my, and my construction to the private sector, and it seems like in the public sector, people are doing a lot better. So they're looking to, pri they're looking to local governments, state governments, as well as federal government to do work. As it relates to the federal government, the federal government buys pretty much everything. You name it, they buy it, from janitorial services to food services to, uh, to testing services to medical services. If, if, if most like, more likely than not, whatever you do, the government may well intend buy. So people are looking to the federal government also because a lot of uh, people realize the federal government actually prompt pays. I'll go over a little bit about that in, uh, in, in a different part of the session. But um, the government is very committed to prompt <coughs> payment, especially as it relates to small business. The government not only prompt pays, but puts the money right into your bank account. So a lot of people and a lot of my clients love that, and that's another reason why they love doing business with the federal government. 
A lot of people like doing business with the federal government because the rules are out there and they're easily under, not, not so much easily understandable, but they're out there and they're transparent. So people know what to expect. The government sets out their expectations and, and, and solicitations, and if people understand and read those solicitations, they can easily comply with, uh, with, with, con with the uh, government's expectations. Another reason is that um, a lot of reasons small businesses are, are, are looking to government is because the government has priority and set, has set priorities for small businesses, realizing that the government, um, uh, I'm sorry, there's been various uh, statistics published, but probably about 95% of all businesses in the United States are small businesses. And so if the government's going to help, help people and help the economy and stimulate the economy, they realize they got to do it through the use of small businesses. Um, uh, 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 besides that, 50% of all businesses owned in the United States are, are owned by women and are owned by women small businesses. And that's why it's a priority to the federal government to contract with small businesses. So you're a business owner and you sell a service that you come to learn is one that is desired by government. And you think that this might be an opportunity for you to expand your base of, of sales. How do you do it? What do you do to become a vendor to the government? Are there certain types of certifications that you need to, you need to secure? Are there certain training programs that are available to you? How do you actually become a qualified vendor, whether it's a, a vendor as a woman-owned business, a vendor as a small business, a, a vendor as a, uh, a veteran's business? How do you do that? Well, you register, and depending on the type of business you are, you certify. For instance, all businesses can register and must register with the federal government, whether you're a large business, and the government actually doesn't have that, that term large business, they call it other than small, but whether we call it large business, whether you're a large business or a small business, whether you're a prime contractor or a subcontractor working on a federal government job or wanting to work on a federal go government job, you must register with the federal government. They were all, the original registrations were all done through something called CCR, Central Contractor Registration. It's now, been, uh, it's now called SAM, and it's the same database where one would register. Now, if you are, once you register, and while you're registering, there's a lot of information that the government you, you'll input. And once you input the, that information, including your gross receipts over three years or your number of employees, the government then will, see, will actually calculate and deem you uh, either a small business or a large business. On top of that, you, um, there are certain certifications for small businesses. There's just the small business designation, which just means that you, you're under a certain um, gross receipts if you're under a certain North American classification code. So it might be, uh, if you're a general contractor, it's 33 and a half million annual gross receipts, um, I'm sorry, uh, averaged over three years. If you're in manufacturing, it's not based upon gross receipts, but it's based upon employees. Small businesses don't have any other type of controls over it. Um, small businesses do not, do not even have to be owned by U.S. citizens. Then the other category of small businesses are, for instance, hub zone businesses. Hub zone businesses it, um, stands for historically underutilized business zone. In order to be hub zone qualified, one's business has to be in a hub zone, and 35% um, of all of its employees have to reside in a hub zone, not necessarily the same hub zone. Um, the other designation, and, and one gets certified by the SBA, or the Small Business Administration, to be hub zone certified. Another certification is um, what we call SBA 8A certification, which is a, small, which is a designation for small bi disadvantaged businesses, um, and it's a nine-year business development program. There are very specific um, triggers and, or an eligibility criteria. Not only do the uh, owner, 51% of the owners have to be U.S. citizens, they have to be socially and economically disadvantaged, and the economic advantages, there are thresholds for e eligibility. That program is a wonderful program because it allows um, persons to be in mentor protégés and it allows um, the government to sole source, among other things. Um, the last type of small business, two other types of small business designations are one is service disabled veteran owned small business. And as you can see, if you're out there in the federal market, there's a lot of work going out to the, through the VA and other um, agencies that are, are looking to work with, small, uh, with service disabled veteran owned small businesses. And 
that is to, uh, the criteria is that it has to be owned and controlled, 51% owned and controlled by service disabled veteran owned, uh, service disabled veterans. Then there is a new designation for contracting, and that's the woman-owned small business program, where 51% of the women have to be U.S. citizens, and it must be owned and controlled by 50%, 51% of, of women. So it sounds like there's an awful lot of certifications and programs that are available to do business with government. I guess the question I'd ask you, Cynthia, is what type of benefit, if any, might there be to become a certified business for those purposes if you're looking to do business with non-government entities? So for instance, the private sector. Does the private sector consider those types of certifications and designations, excuse me, when they're selecting uh, the businesses with which they're going to enter into an agreement? Well, there are a couple of things uh, that are important about certification. If you're looking to work with the private sector, there are two national organizations that private sector companies, major corporations, recognize. The first is the Women's Business Enterprise Council, a national certification agency that certifies women in business. To qualify for that status, you must be at least 51% owned, operated, and the uh, decision maker for the firm. The other or organization that is that nationally recognize, recognizes certification is the National Minority Business Development Council. That organization certifies minority-owned companies that are at least 51% owned, operated, and managed by a minority firm. In the case it, where you are a woman-owned and a minority-owned firm, a woman minority, you might want to consider both agencies because they do have different corporate partners as well as different uh, programs and services available to you. The corporations want to ensure that they are doing business with a legitimate minority or woman-owned business. So it's very important to maximize your opportunities with these corporations by seeking the certification. There's also, Michelle mentioned the various federal certifications and government certifications. But there's also a benefit to companies that want to work with the government. If a corporation has a prime contract with a government agency, they will be looking for women-owned and minority-owned firms to subcontract work to in order to meet their goals. So it's very important if you are a small woman or minority owned firm to research the various certification options available to you, identify which ones would work best for you based on your target market, and then seek the information from the certifying agency about how you can maximize and leverage your certification as a minority or woman-owned supplier. One of the things that we, we always hear in the private sector is, you know, you, you do what you can do to get the work. And if you have to bend a rule, if maybe you have to slightly fracture a rule, sometimes people will try to take liberties when it comes to that. Uh, Bruce, how does that work when you're, when you're a vendor to government? Does the same rule apply or is it uh, a little different? So they get to give the good news, I have to give the bad news now. Is that yeah, that's okay. right. Just checking to be sure. Yeah, that's right. Uh, well, you can do that. Um, you'll be spending some time in federal custody, but you can do it if you want to. Uh, unlike Michelle, most of my clients do not enjoy working with the federal government. But um, no, the, ri the risk you run is people actually get prosecuted for this stuff. You know, people get prosecuted for misrepresentations and applications. People get prosecuted for falsifying vouchers. People get prosecuted for a lot of things relating both to the acquisition of a government contract under some of these programs and also the implementation and execution of the contract. And when I say people get prosecuted for it, um, people go to prison for these things. Uh, under the federal sentencing guidelines for a fraud case, which is what these would be, $30,000 worth of fraud will get you prison time. So it doesn't take long to get up to $30,000 in, in these contracting situations. And if you run the risk that the value of the contract is counted as the amount of loss, you're looking at potentially 10 or more years in prison. So you can't cut corners. In fact, obviously, you're all here because you want to be honest, good contractors who play by the rules. 
Um, and what I advise my clients who are in that position is compliance, upfront planning, uh, all the things that we're going to talk about today are just a simple amount of risk management. It is no different than buying an insurance policy for your vehicles or for your building. You need to spend a little money up front on compliance and it will come back to you in spades down the road. So certainly there's, there's an increased um, amount of activity and awareness uh, at the federal level to make sure that uh, there isn't going to be going to be fraud uh, that, that occurs. Is that, a, is that an accurate description um, or is there, is there not as much uh, interest and not as much uh, authority that's given toward investigators for, for those purposes as, as what maybe we, we might think there is? No, I think, I think the reality, it's both the perception and the reality, is that there is increased law enforcement activity in the government contracting sector. And when I say law enforcement, I don't just mean people with guns and badges who can put you in prison, but also audit, um, and, and people on the civil side, fines, and other enforcement activities. Why? Because that's where the money is. Uh, the two biggest areas right now in the law enforcement field where the resources are pushing is healthcare fraud and government contracting, because that's where the government is spending its money. And there's a lot of reasons why that's where the resources are going. Um, but as we all know, budgets are tight. Uh, a lot of agencies, a lot of enforcement agencies have funding that is dependent upon their being able to show tangible results of their enforcement activities. So if you're the Office of the Inspector General for fill in the blank agency, at the end of the year, you need to have a certain number of pelts to throw on the table to go back to your funding source and say, this was money well spent. Our budget was $150,000, but we recovered $5 million in bad contract money. That's the dynamic that's at play here, um, and that's what's happening. So you are seeing a lot of increased activity in this area, and a lot of it is coming out of the inspector general community, both at the federal, state, and local level. We have inspectors general, and they generally have traditional arrest law enforcement authority, as well as audit authority, and in some areas, program management and program oversight authority. So although they can't punish you, they can publish reports, they can make your life miserable, and, and you don't need that. So yes, Mike, the answer is there's a lot more activity in this sector. So 90-some percent of, of businesses that uh, enter into a relationship with, with government, they, they, they do things the right way, they're never going to be subject to an investigation, uh, and ideally it's a mutually beneficial relationship. In the instances when that may not necessarily be the case, and as a business owner or as a subcontractor on a particular project, you happen to be approached by one of those investigators, what do you do? Uh, you call me. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, y y you don't want to talk to somebody like that without first consulting with a lawyer. Um, because you may have done nothing wrong. But what you've done up till that point and what you're about to say and do is going to be viewed down the road by somebody with 20-20 hindsight who is, is looking at it in the worst possible light, who is looking for a cover-up, who is looking for some shenanigans. They wouldn't be there to talk to you if they didn't suspect something had gone wrong on your project. And you very well may simply be a witness and they need to talk to you and you have no criminal exposure, but you don't know that going into that conversation. And it, this is where lawyers like me come in. We run interference, we talk to them, uh, we speak their language, and we talk to them every day, and we can often negotiate that for you in a way that's both uh, beneficial for your time. I mean, you're in the middle of the day, you hadn't planned for this, it's not on your schedule, you don't want to take an hour out of your time to talk to some agent. Um, and secondly, just in terms of making sure that when you speak to them, you're fully prepared. Um, and thirdly, the advice of a lawyer is an absolute defense in most criminal cases. So the fact that my lawyer told me I could say this to you insulates you. So all of those are good, very good reasons why you don't want to talk to those folks cold. You, you, they're prepared. They spent hours getting ready to come and talk to you. They've caught you off guard for a reason. And you have no legal obligation to talk to them. I'll repeat that. You have no legal obligation to talk to them. Um, and so you want to be responsive and you want to be a good citizen, but you also need to protect yourself. 
Cynthia, to the extent that a business um, may have either a sterling reputation with respect to how they do business with a governmental entity, or they may have a, a blemish or two, does the private sector consider that type of track record when they're choosing uh, partners, um, particularly those partners who might be designated uh, as a certain type of business, be it veteran-owned, small business, uh, minority business, disadvantaged business? What type of correlation, if any, is there between how government might view a business and how the private sector may view that same business? Okay. The difference is major in that um, a private entity is is not going is not as likely to litigate as as the federal government and the concerns that Bruce just raised. However, if you are doing business with a major corporation, they are going to look at a number of factors. Number one, they are going to want to know that you are certified in a legitimate business entity. If you are representing yourself as a women-owned business, they're going to ask you for your Women's Business Enterprise National Council certification document. If you are representing yourself as a minority-owned business, they are going to want to see your National Minority Business Certification document. In addition to that, they are going to want to have a clear understanding of your capacity how well can you execute the contract if they give you a contract for the products or services that you represent? Understand that while they want to do business with a minority or woman-owned business, if you are certified, it's no guarantee that you are going to get a contract. You really have to prove yourself. On the government side, they'll look at past performance. On the private side, they will look to see a what other similar projects have you done in the past in terms of size? What are your financial strengths or limitations? How well are you staffed to execute that project? They will want to understand your value proposition and they'll want you to, they will test you. They will not, they will probably not start you out with a large contract. They, marry, they very mal, may well give you a small contract to start with and ask you to prove yourself. So there are uh, criteria that they will be looking for. It's not as stringent as the federal government. And I always say that the first contract you get with a private corporation is probably the easiest one you'll get. The ones following that, where you really have to continue to prove yourself, compete against incumbents, and um, have best practices in place, over deliver in terms of quality and service is probably what will get you to that second contract opportunity. I'm going to go back to something that was touched on briefly earlier. You know, we're talking a little bit about the difference between being a prime contractor and the difference between being a subcontractor. Uh, Michelle, can you give a little more insight as to whether or not uh, a business that might be selected as a subcontractor should undergo the same type of uh, certification um, process, registration process? as those that might become uh, uh, qualified as a prime contractor. Does the same level of um, uh, scrutiny and oversight uh, uh, appear for the subcontractor as it does for the prime? Um, as it relates to registering as a federal contractor, the answer is yes. You have to each, whether you're working as a prime contractor on a federal project or a subcontractor, one needs to um, comply with the same registrations. As it relates to actually performance of work, the federal government mandates that the prime contractor, whether that prime is a small business or a large business, must comply and take responsibility for the entire contract. So that's really the big difference in terms of um, in terms of the uh, in terms of registration. Once there's a contract in place, however, between the prime contractor, whether it's large or it's small, and the federal government. The, the prime contractor must float what they call flow down requirements under the federal acquisition regulations. Federal acquisition regulations are the procurement regulations or the rules or the terms and conditions under which all federal contracts must be performed. Many of those um, per terms and conditions by law must be flowed down to the subcontractors on all, on all, on all 
different p uh, uh, levels, whether they're sub-subcontractors or not. So there is a lot of compliance that subcontractors must uh, adhere to in performing government contract work. Can, can, I, can, I, can I comment? Yeah, Just certainly. add something that Michelle said. You know, Michelle's talking about if you're, the, if you're in that sort of prime sub or sub and sub-sub relationship, um, you have to be careful. You have to protect yourself. Do due diligence. Don't go in blind. I mean, don't take somebody's word for things. Because again, if a crisis arises later, if a problem arises, you want to be able to show that you employed best practices and you acted in good faith that you didn't just take the person's word for it, that they were a minority-owned business. You have a copy of their certification. You've actually gone out and looked at their facility. They really do have trucks, and they really do have people, and they really do have an, a workforce. Um, do, do your own due diligence, because again, it's a risk management technique that protects you later on. If someone comes after you, you can say, I did everything I could to make sure that we were complying. If I can just piggyback on that, um, the government goals related to small business entities, 20% of prime contracts do are set aside for small businesses. Just in terms of understanding what the opportunity is out there, 5% of prime and subcontracts are for small and disadvantaged businesses. 3% uh, of prime contracts are for hub zones. So as you can see, there are a number of opportunities available as a small or minority or disadvantaged owned business uh, that you can participate in as a subcontractor. I'm going to ask a, a couple questions that have been uh, sent in from some of the guests and uh, I'm going to put Michelle on the hot seat because it's directed to you. Oh, okay. The question is, uh, Michelle, how are larger companies circumventing the thus far maybe? By the, the, far. the FAR. Oh, the, the far. FAR. I'm sorry. The FAR. By starting smaller 8A women-owned and other minority-owned businesses, wholly-owned subsidiaries. Well, I think the, that we know why they're doing it, because of the subcontracting and prime contracting opportunities. How are they doing it? Um, I don't know what they're doing in-house how, but, but uh, there has been a lot of um, scrutiny over uh, fraud in, in, in certifying as a small service disabled women owned uh, aid a contractor. The Government Office of Accountability has put out several reports regarding the fraud and not every small business is, is acting fraudulently. However, there has been some bad apples, so to speak. So um, in reviewing these um, <coughs> reports, I've, I've, I've seen that some uh, companies have in fact um, just set up small businesses, whether they're subsidiaries, because when one registers as a small business with the federal government, you're registering saying, this is who my company is. So they may well have started a new company in a new state, and um, they, we look at the gross revenues. The gross revenues are underneath the size caps, and so therefore they've been able in the past to certify as small businesses. Some people, maybe they've done it on purpose, maybe they haven't done it on purpose, but um, I don't think most have. I just think that they don't know the rules as to what, a, what the rules meaning how a small business is actually defined. A small business is actually defined as what we had talked about is ne either by gross receipts or by number of employees, but it also includes the affiliates of that small business. So when a large business decides to open up a subsidiary, that subsidiary is affiliated with a large business, and the large business is affiliated with a small business. And that is in the past where I've seen a lot of investigations have gone on. Uh, this next question is something that we see fairly regularly, um, and we've not touched on it yet, so I'm glad it was asked. Walk us through how we can contest a firm with a certification that falsified data in their certification which wins a contract. Uh, I don't know if, uh, which, which of you would like to deal with that, but. Well, there one side, a lot of people asked that because they were actually interested parties, meaning they wanted or were pursuing a bid. And that, that process goes on by a size protest normally. It could be a bid protest depending on where uh, in, in the whole uh, procedure this happened and how it happened, what are the actual facts. 
The SBA alone has a sole authority to hear size protests. Size protests go toward um, whether that small business that actually certified itself as a small business is actually small for the purpose of that solicitation. Because even though realistically I might be a small business and have a small business, if I team with someone that's other than small and there is an affiliation or there's too much reliance um, on that large business, one, um, the, the federal government will deem that large business an ostensible subcontractor to the small business. They will then add the gross receipts. They will, I'm sorry, the, the government will then treat that large business and the small business as joint ventures, add their gross receipts together, and deem that that small business is actually large for purposes of the procurement. And the, so what happens is when one see, um, w if one is an interested party and they don't win a bid, there will be a letter that goes out from the contracting officer that says that they are not the successful awardee, but someone else is. At that point, and that one has to follow the notice procedures, one has to then contact the contracting officer, which then contacts the SBA to make a size determination. Um, I'll, I'll approach this from a different perspective. <clears throat> so the, the vast majority, well, I'll start this way. F federal agents are no different than anybody else. Law enforcement agents are no different. They're lazy. Okay? They're going to pursue the, the easy one and not go after the hard one most of the time. The best sources of cases for these sort in this sector, for these fraud cases and investigations, are former spouses, former employees, and disgruntled competitors. And we've, we've done some of that work as well, where people have said, this was just wrong. I know it was wrong. At this point, I don't want that contract. I'm not going to get that contract. But that guy should, some, somebody should look at this. And we've connected them up with the appropriate agency and made a referral and made a report. That's certainly a way you can react if you have evidence of fraud. Given, depending on the circumstances, you also may have a whistleblower claim. If you have uh, non-public knowledge that can prove the fraud, you can file a claim uh, lawsuit under the federal whistleblower statute, and if you are successful, uh, you can get, you will get between 15 and 20 percent of the value of the contract as a finder's fee. So that turns into real money really fast. So um, whistleblower actions, if you have that information, are also a viable option. There's some pros and cons that are beyond the scope of this panel, but that's also an opportunity. One of the questions that was submitted uh, is from a company that's just now getting into the federal contracting arena, and they're wondering if there's any place they can go to either identify what the well, recognized best practices might be, uh, any documents that might help them. Uh, where can they go to find resources like that, resources to identify business opportunities? What's available? Well, on the public side, in terms of free resources, I would run to the local SBA office. They, are, they have a myriad of information. They give out free training. They, are, they, um, they, uh, they have something called an E200 program, which is a wonderful free training program for small businesses where I have seen so many success stories. They have web training. Me, myself, I, I, I see that so many, sm I, go, I attend and speak at a lot of federal conferences. I have seen such an incredible exchange of information at these conferences. Um, there, are there are great speakers, many government speakers, talking about how they interpret their own rules. Um, just sharing, at, sit, going out at, on, when I'm at federal conferences, I'll be standing around or sitting around with people and they're sharing and exchanging information about their own experiences. I locate the, um, the, the various WeBank or Women Business Development Centers or Minority Business Development Agencies have free training as well. Then there's something called the PTAC Center, which is a, uh, is a technical assistance center that focuses on government contracting. They actually have a free bid match system to help you match up federal government contracts as well as state and local contracts. They also help with solicitations, help you understand and review solicitations. I mean, you can ask your attorney or another government advisor to do that, but to the extent you know, PTEC um, officers have that time and can assist you with it, they could also do that as well. So that's a, that's a, that's a good start right there. And on the private sector side, corporations typically do not post bid opportunities, uh, but what you can do is get to know the supplier diversity manager or representative. 
That individual at the corporation does not make buying decisions. They are not part. Of, they are not in procurement. However, they are the liaison between the minority or woman-owned supplier and the corporate procurement department. So they will become your advocate. They, uh, it's also recommended that if you want to do work with a major corporation, that you go online, register in their supplier diversity portal, where you will be asked to uh, identify your company, products and services you have, your certifications, and when there is a need, the supplier diversity manager or director will actually access that database, review your profile, so it's very important that you keep your profiles current, and then they will forward your information to the procurement team that is looking to procure your products or services. You can, it's also important that you do research on these corporations that you're do, looking to do business with, so you can identify whether or not your small or women-owned or minority-owned business can provide solutions to that firm. Visit the website, take a look at what direction that co corporation is growing, what, um, what locations they have facilities in, and then contact the supplier diversity manager, talk about your value proposition, ask them to put you in contact with the procurement team representative so that you can begin to build a relationship and market your firm and your capabilities to that corporation. One thing I wanted to point out in terms of um, the supplier diversity programs my, uh, that utilize the minority business utilization or women business WBE is there is no um, uh, there's no uh, cap as it relates to their gross receipts or as it relates to personal net worth. So you can be a large WBE, you could be a, a woman-owned business doing $400 million a year, and as long as you're women-owned, you can do business under a supplier diversity program. Those supplier diversity programs um, could be Walgreens, could be Target, could be casinos, just any, any large company that has a supplier diversity program nor normally or always takes WBEs and MBEs and you don't have to be a small business to qualify. So that's a huge revenue stream for some of you that may think, well, I might be a minority business or I might be a woman-owned business, but I'm not a small business. Run to the private market and utilize those supplier diversity programs. Michelle makes a very good point. Virtually every major corporation does have a supplier diversity program. In addition, uh, um, hospital, healthcare facilities, and universities also have a supplier diversity program. You can very easily find out who the individual at those entities is responsible for supplier diversity by simply Googling the name of the corporation, Allstate Insurance Supplier Diversity Program. I'll use Allstate as an example because on their website, when you Google supplier diversity at Allstate, uh, which is one of the corporate partners that I work very closely with, they do actually tell you what commodities they are looking to procure. They also give you uh, the name of the supplier diversity individual. They also provide information about, as an example, their mentoring program. Allstate has, for, has a mentoring program for minority and women-owned firms. The criteria for that is that you must be in business at least three years, you must have annual revenues of $150,000, and you must commit that at least one principal from your company or a senior manager will be available to attend the sessions virtual and in person through over a 12 month period. This program is exclusively to help you sustain business growth if you're a woman or minority owned business. They are looking to help you manage uh, growth areas like personnel, sales and marketing, um, access to capital, and there is no charge for this program. In addition, other corporations like Accenture also has a mentoring program. So I encourage you to visit those websites, go to the supplier diversity tab, see what's available, and start building a relationship with the corporations. And think outside of 
just procurement because they do have other programs and resources that can help you grow your business. I'm glad you mentioned the word mentor because Michelle, I know the federal government and various uh, entities, um, agencies that, that fall under that category, they have various uh, mentoring programs, mentor-protege programs. Can you, can you briefly touch on uh, how that works and what the benefit might be to participate in that type of a, of a program? The mentor, there are numerous mentor-protege programs from the federal government and various agencies have them. I believe 13 federal agencies have mentor-protege programs at this time. Um, one uh, agency is the SBA 8A mentor-protege program. The requirements to be in that is that it, what, um, the, the mentor has to be a uh, capable business and have capacity, and the protege has to be SBA 8A certified. Um, the, uh, but there are numerous other uh, mentor-protege programs where one does not have to be 8A certified. For instance, another program is the VA mentor-protege program. The mentor can be a small, uh, large business. It does not have to have a VA contract. It just has to have the capability and capacity to mentor a, a service-disabled veteran firm. Other agencies, for instance, the FAA, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Energy, Department of State, Department of Treasury, and numerous more have mentor-protege programs, and you don't ha you can be just a small business, including the Department of Defense. Um, you can be a hub zone business, you can be an 8A business, you can be a woman-owned business. They really cover all the different small business categories. Many of the mentor-protege programs allow the mentor to mentor one more than one protege, and some of the mentor-protege programs allow you as a protege, or allow a small business as a protege, to have multiple mentors. You have to understand the program requirements and the program rules. Many of, these, many of the programs can go up to three years long. And what's the benefit of the program to the protege? Well, the benefit to the protege, to the protege is business development and financial assistance, which is what all small businesses need. It could be technical assistance and understanding how to estimate, understanding technical areas of, for instance, product manufacturing. It could be um, uh, tech, it could be financial assistance such as bonding, such as helping with banking relationship, uh, giving loans. It could be other assistance. For instance, some um, mentor proteges allow the mentor to invest sometimes up to 10% into the protege company and take equity into that company. This is wonderful for proteges. It helps them build. Other things are, are helping the protege as it relates to business assistance, business development assistance, bidding jobs, managing jobs, staffing jobs, equipment. You name it, the world's the limit as long as the mentor is helping the protege. So if I was in the mentor, I'd say, well, wow, that takes a lot of time and energy out of my resources. What's in it for me? Why would I want to mentor a small company? Well. Some large businesses just want to. They think it's good business. But other reasons that mentors want to mentor small businesses is because of the benefits of the mentor-protege, pro, pro, uh, being a mentor under certain mentor-protege programs. For instance, under the SBA mentor-protege program, the SBA allows the, um, the, the protege and the mentor to joint venture together on projects. So that means that the um, the, the government can prime contract, maybe it's, a, maybe it's an $80 million contract, and, and the mentor and the protege can joint venture on a prime contract together for an 8A sole source or set-aside work. Because it's sole source or set-aside, that large business would never have a access to that type of procurement. So that's a huge benefit for a mentor. Another benefit for a mentor is some mentor proteges give credit evaluation for being a mentor. For instance, the GSA in an open competition when uh, when a mentor and a protege are in that relationship under the GSA mentor protege program, a mentor can provide the mentor protege agreement to uh, along with their bid, and they can get a credit evaluation over other large businesses that aren't in a mentor protege program. The other reason that mentors um, mentor proteges is because they get credit toward their subcontracting goals. Subcontracting goals are absolutely mandatory for large businesses. Um, uh, I'm sorry, large businesses, if the buy is over $1.5 million or $650,000, depending on the industry. 
every large business, whether they, they're a subcontractor or a prime contractor, must have a subcontracting plan. And so when you're a mentor, though, what, the efforts that you partake in mentoring will go toward credit in your subcontracting plan. I've got a question here that asks a little bit about process in terms of getting registered and what the typical length of time is between getting registered and seeing the potential business make its way. But before we answer that question, so I, I'd ask the panel to think about that while I, while I pick on Bruce here for a second. Um, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, fraud in terms of, you know, defrauding government. To get registered, whether it's via a mentor-protege agreement, via some other type of certification, there's an awful lot of paper that needs to be pushed. And I'd be curious to hear your perspective on the, the severity or in the, to, the, to the degree that there are specific instances that you can think of where uh, misrepresenting something uh, on, on paper as you're applying for those types of, of programmatic advantages, whether it's intentional or unintentional, what what is the what what should one be concerned with as far as what they submit in their material as they're applying for those types of certifications? Okay. Well, first of all, there's a big distinction between intentional and unintentional. Let's start. Okay. Let's start with that one. Okay. Um, making a mistake and making a good faith mistake is not a crime. Yeah, you may have to pay a fine. There may be a civil penalty, but it's not a crime. You're not going to prison for that. Um, and I think most government and non-governmental people understand that can happen. Um, it just happens sometimes, okay? If you've got a mistake and you figure it out before they figure it out, fix it. Simple as that, fix it. If they figure it out before you do and they ask you about it, consult with counsel first to make sure it's not gonna be criminal, and then fix it. Um, as I said before, the the investigation that's going to happen is going to be looking backwards with 2020 hindsight at your conduct. And you want to be in the posture of saying, we were honest, we were open, we did the best we could, we tried, we did due diligence, we, we made the, the subs swear to it, we have affidavits from people, you know, we really did our homework. We are trying to be a good, honest uh, business. You know, uh, the simplest way to look at it is, you know, if you're not a crook, don't act like a crook. You know, so if you're not a crook, you have nothing to hide. You should be able to go out and say, we tried the best we can. So on the, on the mistake side of the world, uh, my, my best advice is you, you own up to it, you fix it as fast as you can, and, and you continue to maintain the posture that you have with the government or the, the bidding agency, which is we're a good faith, hardworking company. And like everybody else, we make mistakes sometimes. And that, that's how I would deal with that situation. Um, on the intentional side, don't do it. I mean, it's as, as simple as that. I mean, if it's, if it's intentional, you, you know it before you do it, don't do it. Um, if you do and you get caught, there's much bigger issues to deal with there because you have criminal implications, you have you know, potential Fifth Amendment issues and lots of other more complicated things that I want, need to talk about here. Just don't do it um, because if you get caught, you know, you're, you're risking prison, you're risking disgorgement of any profits or any revenues that you've gotten. Um, debarment from future contracting. Um, even if you escape getting prosecuted criminally, you're going to get whacked with a big civil penalty, so you're going to have to pay money back. So here you went into this project to try to make money, and it's going to be a big money loser, not just because you have to hire an attorney and probably a psychiatrist to deal with all the emotional stress and all those things, but because you did something stupid. <coughs> so so simple thing is just don't do it. Okay. Well then. <laughs> um, does anybody want to take a stab at... Uh, at answering the question as far as the process of, of registering the, the typical time period that lapses between when you become registered and when you might actually see some, uh, see some benefit to that? Re registering is just a federal contractor without a, a specific designation, for instance, hub zone or service disabled is a matter of potentially 24 hours, is entering your information into the government SAM website the government confirming that information and then posting it and, and you know you will be registered as a contractor and when so when do i get my my first contract that's all up to you it really is you need to understand the federal market understand what they buy and spend a lot of time on fed biz ops 
Um, FedBizOps is the official uh, procurement site for the federal government. Um, understand what your NAICS code is, your North American classification code is, your primary, as well as other types of capacity you have. Search the FedBizOps and start responding to them as soon as possible. There's something called Sources Sought, where they're just out there looking for various small business categories to perform work, and you want to raise your hand and say, I can do that. And why do you want to raise your hand? Because the government can only set aside to small business if certain conditions are met. For instance, they can set aside work to women-owned small businesses or hubs-owned businesses if they know two or more, for instance, women-owned businesses can perform the work and have the capacity to do the work and can do that work as a reasonable price. So if the government go, it posts something called sources sought and no one responds to it, then the government cannot set aside contracts for just women to perform. They can't set aside contracts for just 8A to perform if they don't know whether there are two or more 8A subcon I'm sorry, two or more 8A contractors to perform the work. So there's a lot of work on your part. Another really good thing to do is to once again attend these federal uh, conferences because that's where you're going to meet federal contracting officers. At some of the local conferences that I've helped put on and participate in, we've done something called capabilities um, presentations, where we've had contracting officers and people there from the government, from small business offices of the government, as well as uh, uh, as well as diversity. I'm sorry, supplier diversity. Um, program managers such as, for instance, Boeing, come and sit and hear the capabilities of small businesses right there at the conferences. That's a tremendous opportunity for you to get in front of the government uh, and for them to know that you exist and they, they, they say, oh, there's an electrical contract coming up or there's a contract coming up for process systems or logistic management or medical services and they then think about you and say, I can, I can set that aside. Or, and, and in the meantime, what you should be doing if you're small businesses is looking at other small businesses in your field to see if you can team with them. Because when you team, you add capacity. Maybe there's a contract in Illinois and you're in Ohio, but you still have the, you still have the technical expertise to perform that work. You might want to team with another partner in Ohio so geographically you can bid something in Ohio. So there's another re way. And your teaming partners are out there looking for jobs, too. And they're going to call you up. I see it all the time. We host at our office teaming meetings all the time, where we get various contractors, whether they're technology providers or they're general contractors in construction. We get them together for meetings at our offices, let them introduce each other, and talk about potential teaming. Tremendous opportunities. I've seen not only people bid from those teaming meetings, but they've won bids from it. There's no magic answer that, oh boy, I'm 8A certified now, I should get a contract. The other thing is when you are 8A certified, work strongly and intently with the, your local SBA 8A contracting officer to let them know, they're very busy, what your capabilities are, and that if you see, a, for instance, a potential contract coming up at a local Navy base or Army base or something like that, Contact the, uh, your local SBA representative and say, see, because the, see this, I want to go after this as an 8A. Because the SBA has a memorandum of understanding with these agencies to set aside contracts to SBA uh, small businesses as well as hub zone. If I could just take a moment and talk about um, registering with a private sector that is through the certification process that I've already spoke about. The, uh, you will register as a WBE or you'll register as an MBE. The point I want to make very clear here is that the certifications that Michelle has talked about on the government side are not reciprocal on the corporate side. So it's very important that you understand, based on your target market, which certifications you will need. If you do this, um, my area of expertise is with women, so I'll address that. If you decide to become certified as a WBE, the process basically takes 90 days after all of your documents are submitted to the certifying agency. And they are complete. Yeah. You can visit our website at uh, the Women's Business Enterprise National Conference Council and click on certification. It will give you all of the criteria required 
to become certified. And, and Cynthia, the, the other thing, I've, asked, I've been asked so many times, Michelle, should I just, I'm a service disabled veteran, do I need anything else, am I anything else? Get as many certifications as you are eligible for. It, there's a joke amongst government contractors and even contracting officers, they call it the trifecta. So in, for instance, if you're doing business on a city level, whether it's city of Chicago, city of Cleveland, there's normally goals, and there's either WBE goals or MBE goals. If you're a woman and you're a minority, you're either going to be in one or the other category. But the federal government wants to take credit for all the categories it can. So for instance, I represent um, several different women who are service disabled veterans, they're hub zones, they're AAs, and they're women owned small businesses, and they're small businesses. So they, they have all those certifications. So even if you're doing business as an MBE or WBE with private diversity, you still want to register on the federal market and understand the eligibility criteria so you, because you may well be in a hub zone and don't even know it. And by the way, hub zone firms not only get sole source contracts, they get set aside contracts and they get a 10% price evaluation on the open market. So if everybody's price is at 100,000 and the hub zone's at 110, hub zone wins. That's huge. And that has helped a lot of firms win bids. I'm gonna touch on uh, one item here that uh, hopefully we don't have to deal with, but from time to time it certainly arises. Uh, when, when there's some type of an unforeseen crisis that a business encounters, uh, what, what should that business be on the lookout for? What should they do? Uh, what type of crisis? Uh, how do you rank mm -hmm. the crises? What, what, what's the appropriate steps that need to be taken? Sure, and, and that's really where I think those of you who are watching this are, and are here, that's where you're going to run into issues. Because right? you're going to try to do the right thing, you're going to be on the job, and something's going to happen. You're going to have an environmental spill. You're going to have a subcontractor who you find out is using product that doesn't meet the specifications of the job. Uh, you're going to have, you're going to find out that one of your subs is overbilling uh, or that there's a, a dummy vendor that's been created by somebody to siphon money out of the job. Um, you want to be in that, in that scenario, you, again, you want to be the responsible corporate citizen. Stuff happens, but the way that you react to it is going to determine how you are treated later. If it is perceived later that you're covering up, that you're trying to hide facts from the government, it, it creates the inference that you were involved in the wrongdoing in the first place. If on the other hand, you know, again, I would say this consult counsel because you've got to be sure, but once you've consulted, go in, fix it, talk to the government, disclose. Disclosure to the government or to the private company um, is always going to be the best bet in that situation because your hands are clean. You want to say, I discovered the problem, I'm trying to fix the problem, help me fix the problem, you know, part, you're trying to partner up with the people who have the enforcement authority. You're trying to partner up with the people who have the authority to take the contract away from you because you want to be perceived as the good, responsible citizen. So in, in most crisis modes, that's what I would recommend. And, and again, if you find out about theft or, or direct fraud by other subs and people like that, you, know, you report that to law enforcement and you deal with it. It's one o'clock, and uh, we're going to do our best to try to get everybody uh, back to uh, back to your your, your offices uh, in a timely manner. So um, we want to thank you all for coming today. I know there's some questions that were submitted either in person or via the internet, which we didn't have an opportunity to address. Uh, the internet questions we will address um, uh, after this. Uh, if you had a question that you wanted to ask individually, or if you submitted a question which we were not able to get to, feel free to stick around, ask us, and we will answer the question then. But uh, on behalf of McDonald Hopkins, again, we'd like to thank everybody for uh, joining us this afternoon, and everyone have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.